Hello my friends and welcome, my name is Denis and this is the latest update from Ukraine. We have some of the good news coming from the front lines. The Russian assault mostly comes to the standstill in many of the directions, including Avdivka direction. So here we have the Avdivka town, Russians try to reach this area over here, they want to occupy all of this part, but there is no movement from their side for the second consecutive day. Well, the last Russian advancement happened the day before yesterday, they went to Tonenke, taking a couple of the houses. They put their flag just at the edge of this village. But the main thing is that Ukraine was able to reorganize defense in Orlivka and also in Tonenk. Before Russia just slammed Lastochkina and Siverna very fast advancement, but here they're very slow and they're losing lots of the vehicles. Let me show you some of the drone images. Ukraine mostly uses the FPV drones to target the Russian tanks. Those are T-90 tanks. Some of the different modifications, but still our guys were able to target one of them. And later on, one more tank too. Both of them got fire and kaputted. It happened in Avdivka direction. Not just T-90 were spotted over there, but also T-62, very old Russian tank. We can clearly see it on the front mark, even from this distance. Russia is mostly using the same road for advancement from Avdivka, the key road which was used by Ukraine for supply delivery. And we have many of the drone images showing the Russian tanks on that road. It connects Avdivka and Siverne. Partially it is unpaved road. Here is one more Russian BMP in this area. More BMPs and more. As you can see, there is no snow, quite warm temperatures during this winter. From what I saw as a practice, Russia mostly abandoned their BMPs and tanks if they got hit by the FPV drones or something like that, leaving them just on the road or in the fields. Mostly equipment is abandoned or completely destroyed. Here we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9 of the vehicles at the same spot. As you see, Russia started to use the BTRs already, which were caputed by Ukrainian drones. This is the famous spot already, and then Russia tried to assault using some of the BTRs, and just all of them were caputed, causing Russians lots of the losses. We have the FPV video from the 3rd Assault Brigade, how they target one of the Russian BMPs, you may see the crowd of the Russian soldiers on top of that vehicle, and the vehicle is no go. One more video of the Russian assault, it was filmed in February, Russia advanced with BMP, but it was targeted with the anti-tank missile. Was spectacular kaboom. My friends, some of the videos I am unable to show you on this platform, for that please check out my Telegram channel. There I publish all of the recent information concerning Ukrainian topic, there are also some comments, reactions, so quite a nice platform for me to use just on my phone. So if you want to be updated, please join me on Telegram, the link is in the video description just below. I think that you remember this Kaksahin plant on the northwest part of Avdiivka. Well, now it's time for Ukraine to target this area, because Russians took the position. This is the plant filmed by Ukrainian drone, and it was targeted by JDAMs. Ukraine may also use the gliding bombs. Plus, our guys already were there, so they know the vulnerable places of the station. On the south, the fight still continues in Krinki, Kherson Oblast. By the way, around 10 days ago, Shoigu said that they've took Krinki under control fully. So who is fighting out there? Ghosts? My friends, I'll publish this video on the Telegram, because there is just a Russian infantry. One of the tanks decided to go all in, full throttle. I'm going, going like Duracell, but ended. Such a waste. By the way, this Russian advancement attempt happened near to Robotina. Russia still fails taking Robotina under control. But we also have one more loss, so it's better to say two of the losses. M1A1 Abrams tank rolled over the mine, so crew had to leave this vehicle. Why do you think it's the mine? Because of this caterpillar lying on the ground, so it was damaged. Our command decided to evacuate the tank, so they sent the engineering equipment, also based on the Abrams platform, but that equipment also was damaged. The vehicle is called M150 ABV. This sort of vehicle, it has the demining plaque and from the weapon it has just the machine gun on the top. It is based on the Abrams platform. It's supposed to tow the damaged tank but failed with its mission. Because obviously it requires the support. So this evacuation wasn't done properly from the Ukrainian side. 
it's just my guess. And later on Russians understood that Ukraine might take the tank because it's more closer to Ukrainian positions and they sent lots of the FPV drones to finish the Abrams tank, so later on it got fire. But still Russia has many more losses compared to Ukraine and if we check the ratio of the Russian losses, in February they have the most losses since the beginning of the full-scale war with the Ukraine. I moved myself a little for you to see everything, so it's 2022, it's 2023 and it is the beginning of this year, so the new graph with record average daily losses for the Russian side. 983 armor personnel average were lost for the Russian army in February. The losses in February this year is even higher compared to the winter losses in 2023 than there were the active fights in the Bakhmut city. And it was mostly the Wagner army with their prisoners that they took from the Russian prisons. So those losses are not that sensitive for Russia compared to their regular army soldiers. But still it's even higher. So where the trend goes? Now it goes higher, but I believe that it will go down a little, because after all Russia already occupied Avdivka. They still have losses, but those are not as dramatic as they were one week ago. So taking even a small town as Avdivka under control is a huge challenge for the second army in the world. Russia hadn't lost that much compared to their assault missions. That is why attacking side usually loses three times more personnel compared to defending side. Also this graph shows us the escalation in this war. With each year losses are higher. Sadly if Russia loses more so Ukraine. It is the logic of any kind of war. Now the tactics for Russia is to use the midwaves to gain more ground. They don't care about their losses but it cannot continue forever like that. They still have the limit reserve. In his address to the nation Putin called for breeding. Russian people please breed. He said that it will develop the country but I guess that Russia needs more soldiers, that's it. He was concentrated not on the social programs, he wants to rise the taxes actually, but he pointed out about the poor birth rate. My prediction that Ukraine will continue to lose the territories just little by little, because we haven't obtained the military support from the United States, but we see the light at the end of the tunnel, probably through the discharge petition, then the speaker will be out of the voting, finally the House of Representatives might vote for support of Ukraine. But it is again a big question, so when it might happen? At the end of this month or even in April, because implementing discharge petition also takes time. And MAGA Republicans do everything to block this initiative. As usual, it's not a surprise for me. Guys, let's deviate a little to the wider topic, to the possible conflict between NATO countries and Russia, because we hear and see the signals coming from the Russian side and also from the Western politicians and military leaders. So why did France and Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia supported the military initiative to deploy the forces in Ukraine? Because they understand that the Baltic countries could be next and France as a nuclear state, the NATO member and the member of EU would have to protect those countries. Analytics and experts say that Russia will start the war next winter against Lithuania, they will start to break through Suvalki corridor to reach their landlocked territory of Kaliningrad Oblast. And by doing so, they are just cutting all of those three countries from the NATO border, taking those as a hostages. The second stage of the intervention is going directly to those countries. Well, you may say that Russia is struggling in Optivka, how they might attack the other countries, do they have enough resources, probably not, but no, Russia is still producing many of the tanks, armored vehicles, airplanes, they have their own reliable allies like Iran and North Korea, plus China helps a lot. And they're not using the vast part of their equipment in Ukraine, they're collecting those. Mostly they store the new produced T-90 tanks and BMP-3. Also recently we saw the photo of the convoy with the Russian BMPs, they sent those to Belarus, which will take part in this attack. By the way, the Wagner forces are still there in Belarus training the Belarus army, around 1000 of the Wagner soldiers. And again, it's not my scenario, you may find it in Bloomberg and The Telegraph. Their journalists already predicted this scenario, so why would Russia occupy all of those countries? And can it do it? Yes, actually there are not many people living in Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. The population of Lithuania is 2,800,000 around, Latvia almost 2,000,000, Estonia 1,350,000. 
plus count that at least one-fourth of population is pro-Russian, who have old Soviet mindset and who mostly speak Russian. For sure they will not resist against the Russian aggression. Plus most of the weapons from those countries were sent to Ukraine. They understood that it's better to support Ukraine than to fight with Russia directly. If we compare the Baltic countries with Ukraine, only in Kyiv we have 4 million people living. Well, maybe now less, but before it used to be. Those are the official figures, unofficial 5.5 million. So the population of Kyiv is nearly the same as the population of the Baltic countries. Definitely the combined army of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania is weak. And for sure Russia will be successful occupying the parts of those countries. But why Russia would need to escalate the war into the NATO member countries? Well, basically they want to take those countries as a hostages for exchange for Ukraine. If the operation is successful for the Russian army, they will reach Kaliningrad very fast in a few days, occupying the territories of every country at the same time. And they would say, okay, we're gonna give uh, the territories of the countries back, but we're gonna keep Suwalki Corridor. For this exchange, please, allies do not support Ukraine in any sort of means. Our allies obviously will be scared, especially Chancellor Scholz. First of all, scared to use the force against Russia. And they might agree for this proposal, so Russia withdraws their forces from the Baltic countries, but West completely stops supporting Ukraine. Again, those are not just my thoughts. I read some of the experts and this potential scenario was already announced. And yes, Putin is ready to take the risk of the nuclear war escalation. Putin has the reason to think that West is weak. And it could be a golden time for the Russian leader right after the elections in the United States. This gap between November and January. And if Donald Trump wins the elections, I think that this scenario is more than real. Trump already opened his cards of what he thinks about NATO, that the United States will not protect their allies rather than to encourage Russia to attack them. It could be a really scary scenario, especially for those guys. About the nuclear war risk, it is there. But you know that Belarus obtained nukes from the Russian side and now may act separately. Putin may say that it's their job whether they want to use nukes or not. He might say that there is just a crazy Lukashenko dictator who can strike the nearby countries. They have Iskander systems, ballistic missiles with a maximum range of 500 kilometers. But you know that France could potentially ruin the situation for Russia because it's really far away from Belarus to be reached by Iskander missiles with nukes. But it has the capabilities to strike Belarus and Russia too. So crazy Lukashenko dictator variant doesn't work in this case. My idea that France and all of the Baltic countries, they know what might happen. That's why they're building the defense lines close to the Belarus border and the border with Russia. Also, French officials are sure that there is direct threat from Russia to their country. All of that could escalate very quickly and the perfect time, as I say to you, the next winter right after elections. And to understand that future possible political and influential elite of United States will not help the Baltic countries, you may read some of the tweets from Elon Musk. Elon Musk plays now in favor of Trump and MAGA. So we have a comment from David Sachs, uh, he really sucks. In 1991 the Soviet Union fell apart and NATO faced an existential crisis, its reason of being longer existed. But rather than disband, it came up with a new mission to expand. And in a self-referential loop, NATO expansion could create a hostility needed to justify itself. Total bullshit. Well, Elon Musk responds. True, I always wondered why NATO continued to exist, even though its nemesis and reason to exist, the Warsaw Pact, had this solved. And we have the comment from the operator Starsky, yes, it's that dude who built spaceship. NATO founded in 1949, Warsaw Pact in 1955. Six years difference. NATO has nothing to do with the Warsaw Pact, it's the separate thing. NATO was founded not against the Soviet Union, but rather to protect the member states. And the only country which was protected according to the fifth article of NATO is the United States of America after 9-11 attack. No Russia was over there. But Elon Musk is total delulu, and what scares me that the future possible president of the United States shares the same thoughts. Why do I think that Donald Trump has potential of being the future United States president? Because according to any kind of the polls, he is leading by a few percent against Biden. Especially in decisive key states, Trump now has the lead. 
Yeah, few percent, everything might change, but it is a lead. It is admitted even by the Democrat media sources as CNN, for example. So definitely Trump has a chance and for Ukraine, it would be the worst case scenario. Well, still there is small chance, as always, that Trump, instead of seizing the support of Ukraine, will open the new ways of support with more missiles, fighter jets, tanks, etc. But based on his and his command rhetorics, I don't think that he will do it. Especially now that he blocks all of the support for Ukraine. So the only way for Russia not to go to the Baltic states to escalate the war is to support Ukraine with more weaponry for Ukraine to be successful on the front lines. After taking Avdivka, Russian management understood that they are unable to occupy all of those nearby settlements otherwise they would lose all of their army. They also do not want to announce a new mobilization, which will harm Putin's rating, obviously. So they may use the remaining of the forces in the army to attack those countries of Europe to exchange them for Ukraine. That's all they need. In this case, Ukraine without any kind of the military support would start to retreat fast. But still, even in this case, Russia would be unable to occupy all of the Ukraine, I'm sure about it. However, we should be ready for this kind of the scenario for the Russia to open the second front. Luckily, I see the signs of preparation for this possible scenario from our allies. If it doesn't happen, it will be awesome. And finally, today, Ukrainian government gave the funds to construct the defense lines on the south and on the eastern side of Ukraine, in Zaporizhia and Donetsk Oblast. Those should be a reliable infantry trenches and also anti-tank trenches. The defense lines will be built near to the very important cities and towns. In his regular address video today, Zelensky said that Ukraine should be helped, otherwise this conflict may extend to the other countries. That is what I am telling you. The ex-commander of the United States Army, Mark Milley, also says the same. If there is no military support for Ukraine, the world will be different. It means that there are no any guarantees for any sort of the countries, so countries will start to develop their nuclear weaponry. In its turn, it will put our world to the nuclear crisis. The good thing that we still have the military support for many of the European countries and countries in America. I'm sure that USA will also give their military support, but in April, according to the leaked conversation between two of the German generals, France supplied the Scalp cruise missiles to Ukraine using Audi Q7 cars. How did they put the cruise missile inside? Is it so small or the car is so big? About yesterday's kabooms in Feodosia city of Crimea, locals say that the oil port was attacked, so Russia is unable to use that port for now, for some of the days. Meanwhile, Poland continued to block Ukrainian border and military support for Ukraine. Those particular supply vehicles for Ukrainian army are standing in the convoy in a queue, unable to move forward. Ukraine started to produce M113, Max Pro and Humvee vehicles. I think that the parts of those are being delivered to Ukraine and Ukraine assembles them in Ukrainian factories. Italy will cancel the order of the SAM T air defense systems that it should have given to Slovakia. But Slovakian leader Fiko Fakafiso says that he really needs that system to protect his power plants. Against whom, if you are a friend of Russia? Ukraine continued to use the uncontrolled American made Hydra 70 missiles on our helicopters and attack airplanes. It means that Ukraine rely on the Western support, in particular the United States of America. The Wall Street Journal says that Russia sent its spies across the world using the wave of Russians who exited Russia in 2022 and 2023, asking for asylum in Europe and in the United States of America. They will propel the Russian narratives in media sources and will do everything to damage the local order. Meanwhile, the Russian FSB closed the cemetery where Navalny was buried. People were coming to share their respect to Navalny on his grave even on a second day after the funeral. But the Russian police closed the gate. China has switched into the negotiation mode. They sent their representative for the tour. His name is Li Huei. He went to Moscow on 2nd of March, so yesterday. He'll also fly to some of the European countries, including Ukraine. I guess that China is just useless here. To other international news, yesterday Houthis attacked one of the cargo ships. The name of the ship was Rubimar. And this is what happened to it. It totally sank down to the bottom. This is the information that ships sent not to be attacked by Houthis. They say that armored guards, Russians 
on board. Also, if it is down the tanker out there, it would lead to ecological disaster. Even after this cargo ship was hit, there was a huge oil plum, because every ship has the fuel tanks. My friends, please don't forget to press your huge like to this video, by doing so you help me a lot, and also if you want to support my job, you may check out some of the links in the video description just below. You may support me on Patreon or just on the sponsorship of this YouTube channel. My friends, thank you so much for your awesome support. I wish you all a peaceful sky wherever you are and have a great time.